hello everyone. My name is Caitlin Croft. I work here at Influx Data. I'm super excited to have Jeremy White, one of our fantastic community members, here to present how he is using InfluxDB to monitor his saltwater aquarium. As this is a meetup, we would love for you to throw in any questions that you may have for Jeremy. I'm happy to unmute you if you have a bunch of questions and you think it would be easier to just chat with Jeremy. So uh, feel free, don't be shy. There's, of course, there will be some swag uh, option opportunities to win some swag at the end. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to Jeremy. All right, good morning, everyone. So before I dive into my slide deck, just wanna give a quick sneak peek sneak peek into my actual Grafana dashboard that I created. Um, just being able to see some of the telemetry data that I'm collecting from my aquarium so I can see my current, uh, okay, never mind. Sorry, I saw something pop up on Zoom. Uh, I can see my current status. I can see my average statuses for each individual uh, item. And I can see some uh, graphing metrics over Let's take a look at the past seven days. And so I can see like my pH, how it fluctuates up and down. I can see uh, each, of, each of these individual spikes is a dose of uh, alkalinity solution to my aquarium. So I can be able to see all this information and be able to make informed decisions based off the data. So let's just jump right in. So we're gonna be talking about Aquapi today. So this is an open, um, designing it around an open source model to where that you can be able to do plug and play uh, to be able to create an aquarium controller that can scale from one aquarium to a commercial scale. All right, so the agenda for today, we're gonna go over what kind of started uh, me down this path, why I wanted to do it, why did I care about collecting telemetry data, what kind of telemetry data can we, uh, can we get from an aquarium with a very easy, uh, <clears throat> easy tools, What's off, what, off the, what off the shelf products are on the market and is it better to buy or build? How can, how can it scale out? Is it meant to only be a, a one and done solution or is it meant that it, we can scale very wide and be able to collect telemetry data on multiple different systems at the same time and be able to aggregate that data and kind of what I have envisioned for the long-term solution. Um, a little bit about myself, uh, my name is Jeremy White. I'm a managing consultant for Network to Code. Um, we are a uh, kind of a, we're a boutique start, uh, network automation startup uh, based out of New York. Uh, we focus on vendor agnostic solutions, uh, tool agnostic, open source network automation solutions. So we don't care if we're a Cisco, Juniper, Arista, F5. We, we automate everything and we are not really caring what our backend tooling is. So we do a lot with Nornir, we do stuff with Ansible, with raw Python, uh, we've done stuff with Go, and a lot of fun and interesting stuff. And we have, we have some clients that actually use InfluxDB on the back end for some of their telemetry data. Um, I'm, everything that I've done has been, for the most part, self-taught. Um, I do not have, I did not go to college for computer science. I do not have any, uh, any, any uh, formal training uh, around uh, software development. Um, I've also done network automation at scale. I've done work in uh, Fortune 500 companies dealing with uh, uh, network automation in the scale of 20 to 30,000 nodes and how that impacts versus a, a, a smaller, uh, smaller shop. So that's kind of what uh, framed my idea around uh, scalability. And is it scaling for one or scaling for N uh, systems? Yes, the aquarium behind me is a real aquarium. It is my brand new baby that I just bought uh, a few uh, about a few months ago. Um, I have about 15, uh, 15 plus years in the saltwater aquarium hobby. Uh, I started with a 55 gallon tank, uh, very uh, just just uh, fish only, live rock, no coral. But that was I, I got bit by the bug about 15 years ago, and it's been slowly over time iterating as I go. Uh, and when Caitlin and I first uh, chatted, the fr uh, I had a 54 gallon uh, corner aquarium and I was in the process of purchasing and setting up my new one behind me. So it's, 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 a, it's a bug that once you get into it, it's always chasing the next upgrade, the next thing, the bigger coral, brighter coloration, cool fish. And 
It's addictive. It's fun. All right. So motivation. So one of, the, uh, one of the key factors around wanting to be able to collect the telemetry data is I wanted to be able to increase the overall health of my fish. I wanted to be an ethical hobbyist. I wanted to make sure that my fish were healthy, they were happy, that I was not uh, keeping them in a stressful state. And by ensuring that I have a very stable environment, it's reducing the stressors, not only on the fish, but also the coral. And by reducing uh, the stressors on the coral, I'm also in fish, I'm able to increase coloration, I'm able to increase growth and in increase polyp extension. So the polyp extension is something kind of cool and neat uh, from the Aquarius perspective, because especially when we're looking at small polyp stony corals, they're, they're, they don't flow in the movements of the water. They're, they're, they're sticks, they're, they're calcium-based skeletons with a thin uh, tissue exterior that have in the, a little bitty tiny polyps. And so depending on the species, having this the more polyps and you get like this fuzzy look, it's, it's really kind of cool, I like it. Um, and as far as I was wanting to also be able to increase growth. So it's not just about making things look pretty. I want things to be able to grow a lot faster. I want faster calcification for my stony corals. I want faster tissue growth for my soft corals. I want to have actual proper growth patterns with, um, with instable conditions or poor water flow or poor lighting. You can actually get not really great growth patterns. And depending on where things are, where the water flow is and what the light is, you may have an aquapora colony that grows very dense um, in, in, one, in one setup and in another setup with proper flow and proper lighting, it could grow in a very um, spread out pattern. And that, can and that also impacts how fast it can grow at the same time. Um, and with having this, uh, with wanting to achieve an exponential growth, that also gives me the ability to do coral propagation and be able to give back to the aquarium community. And uh, not necessarily free give back, but hopefully getting to the point where the coral propagation that I could, that I could do from my own personal aquarium could be able to be a self-sustaining uh, hobby for myself, where I'm not sneaking out once a month, once a week, once a day, and running to the fish store and, and buying some new coral and not telling my husband. So the idea is maybe I can get to the point where I can do coral propagation in the short term and be able to uh, self-fund my addiction. So I've already kind of touched on stability about it's going to uh, reduce stress on the fish, reduce stress on the coral. Coral are a very, very sensitive creature, but they're very adaptive. So just because a coral is ideally meant to live in a very specific condition doesn't mean it cannot adapt to another condition. Um, but the only caveat to that is that it has to be done slowly over time. And so by reducing uh, variations from uh, either pH, temperature, or other chemicals in the water, right, I can slowly acclimate them to one environment to the other. So I want to make sure that everything is very stable and I can run either very high or very low on certain parameters. That also means that uh, like even within the uh, aquarium hobby, we, we deal with pollutants like phosphate and nitrate, which come from decaying uh, fish waste. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's not necessarily a good thing. It's about finding that right balance. And to have the best coloration, you actually need an elevated level, which is still considerably higher than what's naturally available in natural seawater. But with stability comes increased growth, increased coloration, and increased uh, visual satisfaction. So let's, let's, let's be real for a second. If we're talking about any Aquarius out there, a lot of what traditionally was our time, if you were a um, diligent Aquarius, is a decent amount of manual testing. And the manual testing is going to involve uh, filling, uh, uh, using a pipette to be able to fill little vials of water using a titration test kit or a reagent-based test kit, comparing colors and trying to figure out what's going on with the system. So not actually monitoring the system, but usually it's trying to figure out what's going on. And so it's more reactive. It's a knee-jerk reaction. I see extra algae growing. I see my corals aren't as colorful as they should be. I don't see the growth that I'm expecting what's going on with my tank and trying to use those tests to determine what's going on. And if, uh, if I was to sit down and do all of the tests, I'm talking about 30 minutes to an hour of sitting there filling up multiple different vials of water and trying to figure out what exactly is going on. And it's only a tiny snapshot in time, not a continuous snapshot of the data and be able to compare. And this leads right into procrastination. 
I do my weekly tests. I'll do it tomorrow. Uh, my tests were fine last week. And if the tank looks good. If the tank looks good, I don't need a test. And why test whatever the test is if that test is always perfect? So why, 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 would I t why would I look at and test pH if I, know, if, I, if I think my pH is always perfect when I test it? I may be testing every day at 12 o'clock and the light patterns of my tank may be impacting what the pH is gonna be at 12 o'clock, but I'm not seeing this pH swing from like a 7.89 all the way up to an 8.15 or an 8.2. I'm not seeing that swing, just doing, a, just doing one test a day. So I'm not getting the full picture. And then also, I wanted to be proactive about it. I wanted to be able to get notifications. I wanted to see if something was going wrong and be able to address it before it became a problem. So catch an issue before it becomes a problem and be able to get granular level from if I'm getting something starting to look awry to holy crap, I need to address this right now. And then, okay, things are back to normal. And the cool thing with Grafana, it has several pluggable notification solutions. There's email, there's Slack, there's PagerDuty. There's this giant slew of what makes sense for you. Um, I'm deeply embedded with Slack with the company I work with. I think I have like 10 or 11 Slack workspaces I'm a member of between open source stuff and community and uh, work. So Slack makes sense to me. And it's very easy for me to configure notifications in Grafana to be able to understand what's going on. Um, at the drop of a hat. So just some quick screenshots already uh, sh showed what the Grafana dashboard looks like. We're able to see what my current pH is, what my average is. Um, you can see that since I'm early in the morning that I'm, I'm bottoming out on my pH and then throughout the day because the, uh, the photosynthesis is going to be reducing the amount of CO2 in the water and so my pH is actually going to be going up. And then as soon as my lights go off in the main aquarium and my filter kicks on its lights, it's not as powerful as the 400 watts of lights for the main aquarium, so my pH slowly drops, and then I, my lights come back on in the morning, and it just kind of ebbs and flows. Having a little bit of about, I think it's about a, less than a 0.2 variation of pH is within tolerance. If I was to have drastic variations, like if I was to not have my light and my filter turning on at night, my pH would drop a lot more. And so my average pH would be dropping and I'd have a larger variation. And then just a screenshot of a test alert that I created within uh, Grafana to be able to send to uh, a Slack workspace that I'm part of. And also showing the power of getting telemetry data. So this is a very old screenshot from whenever I first started. I need to stop messing with my wheel. There we go. All right, so this is a graph of when I first started using uh, the AquaPi. In the very beginning, I did not see any value in doing um, power control. I didn't, because I, I had a timer, my, my lights were all set on a timer, and so like, I didn't see any value in being able to control power outlets uh, with the AquaPi. And we can see in the very beginning, I was having drastic fluctuations in temperature. I was having almost, uh, I was having almost two and a half degrees in a temperature flux within a day. Well, I saw this information and I reacted to it and I very quickly implemented uh, the ability to do event-based actions based off of a uh, IoT sensor. So now, when I, uh, now I have the ability to set up a, uh, whenever this specific graph was done, I had a fan that was set up that any time the temperature reached a certain threshold, it would immediately uh, kick on a fan. And I was able to keep the temperature within a 0.2 uh, degree fluctuation. Since moving to the bigger tank, I don't have uh, that ability just yet. Um, the heater that I was using in the previous tank had, had less of a variation in its on off cycles. Whereas the new tank, uh, since it's a lot larger, I can't use the same heater. So my, my variations are a little bit more out of whack, in my opinion. Um, I'm going to be making a new purchase to, to try and get that slimmed down to, I'm hoping, a one degree uh, temperature uh, fluctuation. All right, so the telemetry types that we're, uh, telemetry data types that we're going to be looking at. Temperature, there's digital sensors. So Prior to having this, I could just walk by the tank, be able to see what the current temperature is, but also back to my comment before, 
I see it one time a day, not constantly looking at it. I'm not having my baseline data. I don't know re what really is going on. Um, being able to collect it and sort it in a time series database, I'm always sampling data. I can better understand what my fluctuations are and I can see the impact of, of uh, my equipment is having on the aquarium itself. So if we look at the temperature fluctuations on the current graph, we'll see it's, it goes up and it continues to go up during the day while the lights are on. So I've got 400 watts of, LED, of high powered LEDs shining down into the aquarium. So that contributes to the temperature crawling up during the day. And as soon as they shut off, it falls down. So there's still work that I need to do to, to try and get that a little bit tighter. And then I can also do event-based uh, actions based off of the information I'm getting from the, uh, from, from the IoT sensors. Salinity, same thing. Why does it matter? It, 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 if the salinity is not right, nothing is healthy. And whenever you test the salinity, you're only testing a single snapshot in time. And there are several things that can really impact um, how the salinity, uh, how, how your salinity can fluctuate. This should be one of your most stable uh, telemetry data, or one of your, one of your most stable uh, data points. And what can cause it to, uh, to be off is that, let's say you have an auto top off system that's automatically adding fresh water uh, based off of a uh, optical sensor. If that auto top off runs dry, you're no longer adding water to the system. So your salinity is slowly gonna creep up. Also, if the auto top off fails in an on position, because uh, a lot of these, uh, a lot of the equipment in the aquarium hobby is consumer grade and not industrial grade, it will fail. And it should, you should always plan for it to fail in the worst possible position. So for auto top off, that's failing in the on position. So it, for instance, if you have a 20 gallon um, tank and you have a five gallon auto top off, shoot, that's 25% of your water, just getting uh, salt water getting replaced with fresh water. And so you could very quickly cause a, a major imbalance and cause a lot of uh, chaos uh, from, from, from your tank and potentially has, have casualties. And then also a uh, two-part solution for alkalinity and uh, calcium. Just natively using most two-part solutions, it's slowly going to cause your uh, salinity to increase. So just being able to have a, an eye on that and be able to see what the data is trending at is very, very key. Uh, pH, it's reagent based color scale, so it's very subjective. It's dependent on the lighting in the room. You're comparing it to a, to a little postcard that has the different colors for each pH. Um, and for me, I, I always have difficulty deciding on where it falls in the scale. And I'm not colorblind. If I was colorblind, I would be totally screwed. Uh, for collecting in time series, I'm always collecting data. I'm always sampling my data. I can detect an issue before it becomes a problem. Uh, for instance, if an auto doser for like, cal if cal I'm sorry, if an auto doser is stuck in an on position, so like calcium and alkalinity, those elements do directly affect the pH. And so if my alkalinity, is, if my alkalinity doser is constantly putting out solution into the system, my pH is gonna skyrocket. And my, my tank is gonna turn completely white and cloudy, and I'm, gonna have, I'm probably going to have casualties. If I was using a calcium reactor, which uses a CO2 to dissolve uh, calcium, uh, I'm sorry, coral skeletons, it's actually going to cause my pH to fall if it's, if it's stuck in an on position and it's delivering too much uh, calcium solution from the calcium reactor. And you can also see uh, effects from like, for instance, a protein skimmer not running to where you're not getting um, the, the O2 saturation within the water that you're desiring. And so you can see these, these different things can be directly correlated to specific failures. And if you can catch the failure as soon as it happens before things die, that is the best thing. So like I said, ethical hobbyists. ORP, uh, so this is the oxidation of organics in the water. And so with a higher, so you don't wanna go too high, but a higher ORP means that your tank is able to effectively break down uh, pollutants within the water. Uh, and when I say pollutants, I'm meaning more like uh, fish waste or uh, decaying uh, uneaten fish food. Um, and by measuring ORP, you're able to detect if a skimmer has failed, if you don't have the proper, uh, properly sized skimmer, if you're, if you're running an ozone uh, filter, if your ozone is pumping too much ozone or not enough ozone into your filter, or if you have an unseen livestock casualty. 
Um, if you have a tremendous amount of uh, decay, your ORP is going to drop. So it, it, this can be another telltale sign that something is going on that you need that you need to get your you need to address. And then major, minor, and trace elements. These are unfortunately are not able to be uh, right now done with an IoT sensor. There are some off-the-shelf solutions that can monitor calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium. These are your building blocks for your coral skeletons. Um, and the off-the-shelf solutions that can monitor these, these are actually doing, uh, they're pulling water out, they're doing a reagent test kit, test kit a test against, uh, against the water, and using a color meter to be able to determine the exact levels. So ideally, yes, I would love to get there one day. Realistically, it's gonna require so many more moving parts and a lot more of my time, not, not anywhere near or on the near term for my roadmap. And then the nitrogen and, uh, and phosphorus. So this is gonna be your, your pollutants from uh, fish waste and decaying uneaten food. And so how nitrogen, uh, how the nitrogen cycle from ammonia coming from fish gills is converted to nitrate, to nitrate and then to nitrogen gas. And similar with the phosphate life cycle and the actual availability of it within the water column. So previously I made a comment that in the, in the ocean, the, that number is near zero, but in your, your aquarium, that number is never going to be zero, or it's going to, it, you shouldn't strive for zero in my opinion. And it's not just necessarily nitrates and phosphates, it's also available nitrogen and phosphorus within the, within the water column. Um, the coral is actually an organism that has a symbiotic relationship with zooxanthellae uh, algae. And so the zooxanthellae algae is what's uh, performing the photosynthesis and is consuming the nitrogen and phosphorus gas that's readily available within the water column to provide um, essential amino acids to the coral organism to be able to, uh, to metabolize itself and then be able to calcify its coral skeleton, build more tissue, and so on. And then also, we're, we're talking about collecting telemetry data on what's in the water column. What about, what are, what's, what are we doing to touch the water column? So absolutely being able to collect the telemetry data on what your life cycle is, every time you have a dosing pump event, heater cycles, fans turning on and off, auto top off, if you're simulating the natural, uh, natural wave actions within the aquarium, and feeding. And, there are auto feeder solutions out there. It'd be cool to be able to, to say exactly at this time, if I see a tiny uh, drop in my ORP, for, for instance, that, may, that could potentially be tied to a feeding event. So I'm dumping a lot of food in the water and it could potentially drop my ORP for a very short period of time, but be able to get all this data in a centralized solution and be able to make informed decisions on it. All right. Build versus buy. So there is a uh, off-the-shelf solution that's already out there. The off-the-shelf solution, uh, so that you do not limit yourself, has a starting price of $800. The my design and what I'm doing, I'm not seeing myself as a cheaper option. I'm seeing myself as a lower barrier for entry. So in the at the end of the day, I might still spend $800 to get the same for same uh, features but I'm able to start with $200 and slowly build my way up and slowly contribute to my addiction instead of having my husband look at my credit card statement and say, holy crap, why did you spend $1,000 on something for the aquarium? You just spent way too much money. You're done. No, you're, you're done. So I can slip in these little secret things from Amazon and other online retailers instead of seeing a $1,000 charge from uh, my fish store. And so, and so, that off-the-shelf solution does have a cheaper entry price solution, but you're limit, uh, but it's creating a limiting factor for it. So it, it does make it, it, it's not that you can't do the same thing, that just you, you, with a cheaper option from them, it's just you, you create some limitations uh, upon yourself if you do it. And I wanted to make sure every part of, of the solution was completely user replaceable and an and a end user with minimal knowledge could just assemble things together. There's another open source solution out there for this exact market. I decided not to go with that solution because using a breadboard and being able to solder things together and the electrical engineering aspect didn't really interest me that much. And having something that was truly plug and play and I could be able to give to my husband who is non-technical and say, here's, here's your instructions, assemble everything together and not have to worry about anything. 
And heck, talking about technical skill set uh, and being able to assemble something and not hurt yourself. In my previous aquarium, I actually ended up having to go to the hospital. I was trying to uh, reduce noise from, from the overflow and I was cutting a piece of silicone tubing. And I was using the wrong tool for the wrong job and not doing anything safety related. I, I saw earlier that I had some people from oil and gas that I, that I recognize their names on so they can, I'm sure they're like shaking their head with their thoughts of our time at, uh, our, our time working together and the amount of safety culture that was ingrained in, in, in us. Um, and I skipped a step. I did something completely incorrectly and I had a blade cut a one inch uh, long gash in my knee and I was in the hospital for my aquarium. So technical skill set to be able to do something truly is, is or was a consideration whenever I was designing this uh, solution because I don't like doing, I don't like dealing with electrical engineering stuff when it, like, like I said, breadboards and soldering irons are not my thing. Um, and depending on, on, on who it might be, that might be a little bit too much for them as well. Like I said, that, that, that my cup of tea, I want to make it as easy peasy as possible. Integration capabilities. I wanted to make sure everything truly was plug and play that there was no high barrier for entry. So the, the, the lowest barrier for, in, so the highest barrier for entry is setting up the Raspberry Pi itself. And there are very well-documented solutions out there on how to uh, flash a, um, an SD card with the Raspbian uh, image and how to get everything set up. So that is the highest barrier for entry. And everything that, is, uh, that I've developed thus far is built to be non-proprietary. It's built so that if you want to swap something out, it should be very simple and adding for support for a, another vendor or another solution should also be able to be very easy. And if everything is written in Python, um, so super easy, super simple, keep it simple. And looking, I, I look at it as starting off with an empty toolbox. Um, the off-the-shelf solution absolutely is a Swiss Army knife and has a tremendous has tremendous power and has all these different capabilities from day one. But from day one, I don't need all those stuff. I only care about just getting some bare minimum stuff to be able to collect data and understand what's going on. Um, so, like I said, the uh, off-the-shelf solution is a great solution. It just gets, it's a higher barrier for entry from a financial perspective. I wanted to try and see if I could do this uh, more cost effective and then also give me some freedom to where if I wanted to integrate something uh, that was not part of their, their stack, I could integrate it. I, I, I could set up my own power control and not require to use their expensive power solution. But to each their own. The design itself is based off of Python. Uh, we're running, I'm running Docker on the Raspberry Pi itself, controlling everything with Docker Compose. I have Grafana for visualization. Uh, Postgres is used for the uh, Django ORM. So being able to manage like the users, the jobs itself, and what, what the actual workers are doing. Uh, I'm using uh, an RQ scheduler to be able to schedule each individual job that's being done. An RQ worker is picking up those jobs from a Redis queue to be able to work on them. And then it's sending it to, uh, I have a little uh, white box cynical hat and the, at the end of the presentation, I've got a full parts list. And that is actually uh, what is in, uh, interfacing with the GPIO uh, breakout. And all of the individual sensors are connected to, the, to, to that individual hat. And that's what's measuring the, uh, measuring the data from the aquarium. And for the development cycle, the idea around this was always be assessing always assess the data that I'm getting in. And then once I get the data, let's create some automation uh, so I can try and make everything as stable as possible. Then look at other features and other monitors so I can either get more data or do better things with the data. And then adding additional uh, tool support for like either power control or uh, something else. And just a, a shameless pl plug for Agile, fail fast. Everything, is an, everything starts as an MVP from, the, from my development lifecycle. I don't want to spend weeks and weeks in my spare time developing something to then just come, come to the end like, nah, this doesn't work. I want to get something minimal out the door first 
and see if it's going to give me the value that I need. And if it doesn't, worst case scenario, I'm out some money and I'm out maybe a few days of my time. I'm not out money in months or weeks of my time in development life cycle. All right, scalability. So for the home Aquarius, this, like I said, I, I came from a Fortune 500 oil and gas uh, and scaling large was a big thing for me. Very simple, one Raspberry Pi, couple sensors, and you're off to the races. Uh, and you can buy parts as needed. You don't need to get that full $800 solution out the gate. You can start with two, $300 and get something working and slowly feed the addiction as things go. And at this very moment, there's not integrations with voice assistants, but it's totally capable. Uh, I've done event-based automation uh, for networking with uh, Google Home and Alexa. I actually presented last year at a Google meetup uh, on how to use uh, Google Home to do a, uh, automation. So how to, how to configure a VLAN on a network. It's pretty cool. Then for commercial scale. So since everything is centralized around using a centralized message bus, a centralized uh, time series database, uh, centralized dashboards, and then the Raspberry Pi, so the workers, you could essentially have one-to-end monitors. So if you had multiple systems out there, you could have several uh, deployed and all feeding data back to a centralized solution. That was one of the, and going back to keep it simple, keep it easy, that was one of the main deciding factors on using um, InfluxDB. I've used it for clients in the past and the barrier for entry to be able to get uh, to get running was very, very low. So not having to spend a tremendous amount of development cycles or trying to figure out what the heck do I need to do? What's this endpoint? What's my off method? What's, what's everything going? Um, just by pulling in the InfluxDB container and being able to do a simple post to one URI, I'm off to the races. And then Grafana has its own uh, native plugins to InfluxDB. So always about barrier for entry being very, very low. And then for my long-term vision, there's some more integrations that I wanna do. I wanna do Bluetooth low energy integrations with the Hydra lights. Uh, the Hydra lights uh, actually can, are controlled with, you can control them with a XML payload. So you can download someone else's template and be able to upload someone else's lighting schedule or, or, or whatnot to the lights. And I think it'd be awesome to be able to uh, use that to be able to mimic uh, natural light, uh, daylight and moonlight cycles of coral reefs like Tonga or Australia or Indonesia. Also, I would like to integrate Bluetooth uh, LE with uh, the Kimura dosing pump. So be able to understand exactly ex the exact moment a, a single dosing pump goes off or be able to actually do event-based uh, actions to where that if I'm detecting that my pH is dropping, I could drop in some more alkalinity solution if that, if that would be the case. Or if I see my pH is skyrocketing, make sure that everything is shut off for my dosing pumps. Uh, and also if I was doing a water change, I, I, would, I would ideally want to be able to have one button to push to shut everything off and not have to open my phone, go to uh, the hydras, shut off my hydras, go to my uh, dosing pump, shut off my dosing pump, go to Aquapi, shut it off. I'd like to have just one place to shut everything off. Plenum Busy Light. So this is a really cool thing that I, I've used at previous employers where it ties directly into your messaging platform. And so it can flash different colors, it can make noises, and having some type of visual notification um, if something really starts going wrong. So I'm at my desk, it's in my office, I'm here all day. So if I have an all of a sudden of red flashing light behind me, I know, holy crap, I missed a message, I need to do something. And then also zero to 10 uh, PWM power control. So be able to, uh, for the solutions that do not communicate over uh, Bluetooth low energy or wireless communication. So we're th I'm thinking like something to be able to control like Kessel lighting or uh, some pumps that, are, that, that give you the ability to have that one to 10 or zero to 10 volt uh, power control. From a grow out experience, um, I would like to start doing some type of controlled ex experiments at some point to be able to assess the impacts these chemicals and the levels have on the uh, corals itself to try and be able to increase the calcification and check, check to see if, the, if actually running elevated levels and dosing amino acids truly has benefits. Um, there's several companies that out there that offer uh, coral amino acids and they have their own 
controlled research that says that there is benefits, but I'd like to see for myself to see is, uh, is dosing amino acids worth it or am I putting more money to, towards my addiction that I could redirect to coral. And then lastly, I really would love to be able to evolve um, modern aquaculture. All, all coral is done, uh, for all, aquaculture, all aquaculture coral is done through uh, some form of asexual propagation. Most of your stony corals are done through um, coral fragmentation, which is a natural thing that occurs on the reef where a piece of coral breaks off and where it lands, a new piece grows from that piece, that tiny piece that was broken off. Uh, most, of your most of your small polyp stony corals do very well with fragmentation, but then you have a lot of uh, large polyp stony corals like uh, Scolomias, uh, Elegance, uh, and several other ones that don't do well with fragmentation. Um, and so if we could if we could get the ability to uh, have to, to induce coral spawning in captivity for an aquaculture, not just scientific purpose, but for aquaculture purposes, we could be able to have a lot more self-sustaining hobby and not and, and be able to re, uh, be able to eliminate the need to go back to the coral reefs to sustain a hobby. Um, most, if not all, the coral that I have in my aquarium is all aquacultured or maricultured. Maricultured is the same thing, except it's done in coral farms in uh, specific areas of the ocean, so not actually on the reef. These are artificial coral farms that are just offshore. Um, and there's a lot of aquaculture facilities out there that, uh, that they, they have documented cases of 20 plus years of having certain strains of uh, stony corals aquacultured in captivity. And being able to do, uh, to potentially do a sexual reproduction of corals in captivity, not only could it be a game changer for the hobby, it could also potentially help us reseed our natural reefs, to be able to contribute back to such a beautiful place that has helped so from medical research to uh, hobbyists to uh, the, um, the communities in the reefs, uh, in, in those areas, to be able to give back to that would just be phenomenal. And then just looking at it from the Qual Rock Run perspective and looking at it from the MVP perspective, start collecting the data, build something to make it stable, use the telemetry data to design experiments, try and get captive, uh, uh, in, uh, captivity spawnings, and then try and do what I can to mature a coral from a spawn to adulthood. Uh, there have been some cases of coral spawning in hobbyists based off of some newer lighting systems that, that have come out. But the, uh, the larval state and the settlement uh, stages of, um, of those attempts are next to impossible for most hobbyists at this time. So, and then, like I said, I've got the parts list here. So let's jump over, take a look. So again, like I said, this is all done through Grafana. Grafana is my user interface for being able to get at the data. Uh, and be able to understand what's going on. I do have a very simple Django application that's used to manage the RQ worker and the RQ scheduler. So I can be able to see the individual jobs that are defined. I'm able to see uh, what sensors I have the capability of being able to use. Uh, I define my Influx database, just a few other things. So if I was needing to go to multiple different Influx databases or have different sensors or define something differently, this is where it's all managed. And I believe scheduled jobs is where, nope. Um, repeatable, there we go, repeatable jobs. So this is how uh, the RQ scheduler is putting in the job into the Redis queue that is being consumed by the Redis worker. Then I have, uh, so it's all on GitHub. It's under my, uh, uh, my name on GitHub, YJ6, uh, Aquapi. And then if you want to check out, I, there is a forum, uh, Reef to Reef, and there is a separate thread for Aquapi. It's a Django REST framework uh, controller. Uh, so yeah. So I see that we do have a question where possible models linking variables between research, respectively modeled algebraically like regression evaluation 
and what machine uh, and on assuming machine uh, machine learning models uh, have been used. Um, do you want me not, to do you want me to unmute him and maybe you guys can talk about it. Yeah, because I'm I'm not sure if I'm understanding the question. So let's 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 talk to Victor. Okay, Victor, you can uh, unmute yourself now if you'd like to talk. Can you hear me? Can you hear yes, me? We can, yes, we can hear you. Okay, so uh, I only now realized that uh, uh, probably the scope was only, uh, you know, using, uh, displaying uh, the use of Grafana and uh, the data coming in uh, and so on and uh, flows and the databases, but no actual machine learning modeling. Is it correct in this that case? Is, that is correct. There is no machine learning at this time. Um, for, first was just to get the data. Uh, so a reference to South Park, uh, the underpants gnome episode. The underpants gnomes, they had three phases. Phase one, gather underpants. So phase one for me is gather data. Phase two, cut to blank screen. Phase three, profit. So <laughs> we're just, I'm just in the data gathering phase. Um, what I'm going to do with that data long term is yet to be determined. Uh, I have a colleague on my team uh, who is very interested in data science and I, I'm, I'm may be wrong, but I believe her, uh, um, her dissertation was done on, uh, on some form of uh, a data science topic. I can't remember exactly which one. She's going to strangle me for not remembering that. But right now, I'm just collecting the data. Um, and maybe in, once I'm more comfortable with it, I can expose it to, uh, like, throw it out in like an elastic beanstalk deployment and, and allow the data to be consumed by anyone who wants to consume it to that if anyone wants to run any type of machine learning against the data, it, it'll be out there and be consumable. Uh, sorry, uh, yes, uh, this, also, this is another question. Maybe it's, it's more relevant. How did you know what kind of data to collect if, if uh, what kind of variables are of interest? Did you research, uh, you know, chemistry books or, or stuff like this? Uh, how did you know what kind of sensors to, which sensors to use, which not, and so on? You, you actually made the choice of sensors, no? Yes, uh, I made the choice of sensors. Um, I did that based off of uh, just previous experience in the hobby and also uh, t taking cue from the off-the-shelf solution. Um, I did do, I have done additional research to see what additional capabilities I can do. So there, are, there is the ability to do CO2, uh, dissolved oxygen, uh, and a few other sensors that are just readily available. Um, and there, in my mind, ideally long-term, I would love to be able to do reagent-based testing. Um, the barrier for entry from, from, from me on that is higher. And so my understanding, my, my knowledge and skill set on how I can properly build and program a, um, a reagent-based test, testing solution is a little bit more than I have to, uh, have the, the cycles for, but that, that's totally something that I would like to do. Yes, like the nitric acid, uh, stuff like this. Uh, uh, I, I know that uh, it's in the test uh, for uh, the aquariums, uh, uh, level of uh, nitrates in the water mm -hmm. and stuff like this. So, yes, so this, this is, uh, uh, an important part of data engineering. Let's say. Mm -hmm. Where you collect, uh, you know what to collect, uh, which variables you have made the choice of variables, and then you can model, uh, I don't know, temperature, what your uh, target variable is uh, as a function of, of the these sensor data collected and uh, these, uh, kept, uh, these uh, variables you, you have chosen uh, as uh, measured from the sensors. Yep. So you already do a, a modeling, which is very powerful. And so data collection is not only uh, per se gathering a huge pile of data, but what kind of data relevant uh, for, so you, 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 you already have, must or normally already have in mind some kind of modeling, which mm, you know what variables are important. This mm -hmm. is important. Yep. Cool. 
Uh, thank you, Victor. Um, so there's another question here. Uh, is the volume of data that high that we would need an InfluxDB database? I thought any open source relational database would solve the purpose. The volume of data for home Aquarius is not that high. Um, this is all coming down to being able to build something that can scale. Um, and my idea, so my, my pipe dream is one day I'm going to win the lottery and I'm going to leave IT and I'm going to be a coral farmer. And when that day comes, I don't know if I want to be uh, throwing millions of rows of uh, telemetry data into a Postgres database. And so I wanted to be able to build something that I felt would properly scale when uh, collecting telemetry data. And I did not feel that a, a, a traditional re a relational database would, uh, would, 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 do, would do me good for that. And I think also time is a really interesting component for you, right? Like looking at what else was happening at that given point, like, you know, let's take pH. You know, maybe your pH was going a little crazy at some point, knowing else was going on at that point was probably really interesting to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, are you pulling the data from the sensors or are those plucking data to your, or plucking data to your app or pushing, sorry, <laughs> are you pulling data from the sensors or are those pushing data to your app? It is a pull situation. So uh, what happens is the RQ scheduler push, uh, publishes a job to the Redis queue and the RQ workers attached to that queue and is waiting for a job to come in. Once the job comes in, the uh, RQ worker is actually what opens up the I2C protocol uh, to be able to connect to the sensor and gather the data, store it, and be able to send it to the uh, InfluxDB. So I know there was a lot of conversation about the different components that Jeremy's using. I did, you know, when I initially spoke to Jeremy, um, I wrote this whole blog interview with him and there's, I'm posting it in chat right now. At the bottom of it, there's a ton of links. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more of how Jeremy has built this, um, feel free to check out. There's also some cool photos of his aquarium that obviously you can see in his background and also just of his coral. Um, yeah, it's a really fun story. Like I think, especially with all of us being stuck at home, like I'm sure you had even more time in the last six months to tinker with <laughs> your setup and perfect it. Well, I mean, I've always had time. I, I've been a remote employee for, for two years now. Um, so this, I mean, it's given me the ability to working from home, just go all hog wild and do something super cool and super fun. And, and in, in, my, in my home office. See, so we have a Absolutely. question. What was the difficulty of calibrating the sensors? Um, so that's a feature request that I've had in mind um, to build it into Django, to be able to just natively do it within Django REST framework. Um, essentially, the process that I would have to go through today if I felt a sensor was out of sync would be to stop the workers manually be so I would probably end up just taking down the uh, the the Docker Compose to so do a Docker Compose down to take down the full stack just so I didn't have a split brain um, and then manually interact with the I2C um, and the Atlas Scientific actually has very clear and easy to understand documentation um, on being able to calibrate the sensors uh, so it's 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 very it's very simple as being able to use their command line tool issue a clear and then issue the value that it's supposed to be and it sets it within the uh, the their their individual little uh, chip that you have to buy for each sensor. Uh, I'm going to actually unmute Jean-Pierre just because um, they had a couple of questions. Maybe they want to elaborate on any of anything else. So Jean-Pierre, you're more than welcome to unmute yourself and talk uh, with Jeremy if you like. Uh, Not to first, put you on the Jeremy, spot or anything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, first, Jeremy, I'd like to thank you, you know, for this uh, wonderful, you know, uh, speech. Yeah, I think a lot of uh, elements which are not so easy are, are in the details, you know, of how uh, you set up the right sensor or you are sure that they are right calibrated. Uh, how you 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 set up the way they communicate, you know, with the Raspberry Pi and so on. So, 
was it something which was uh, taking a lot of time for you or, or, or what was the process of doing it? So understanding how to work with the sensors and how to set it up with the Raspberry Pi was surprisingly simple when I got it working. <laughs> the all, so the reason why I say that is um, Atlas Scientific, I feel the documentation they have has been great. And I will make one comment about things, something that either wasn't called out as as clearly as I thought it should be, or I just completely glazed over it and didn't pay attention. When you buy the sensors, they are not set to the I2C protocol. So it's not necessarily the probe itself, it's the actual little printed circuit board. So that was my only qualm with their documentation is either I glanced or I grazed over, grazed over it and didn't pay attention, which is completely possible, or it wasn't called out clear enough. There's a separate little like $10 part that you have to buy that you can set it to, I can't remember what the other protocol is. I think USB and uh, I2C, I'd have to double check. But the barrier for entry for them was very simple, a very, very lightweight. Um, they have a, uh, a PyPI library that can be consumed and some examples on how to, to work with their sensors with uh, Python. Okay, thanks. Awesome. Uh, maybe another question, Jeremy. Sure. Uh, you you are using InfluxDB, mm -hmm. uh, which really makes sense because you are working a lot with time series. But I can imagine that in terms of uh, frequency of your measurements, those are probably not so high because you you, you don't need to to measure the frequency at uh, something like ten thousand per per second. So. What, what was really the value of InfluxDB? Is it, uh, you know, uh, the ability to have several operators on uh, time series or, or, or yeah, what, what was your choice compared to having, uh, I would be say, a simple storage inside a, a traditional PostgreSQL, for example, database? The main main driver behind it was not what I'm using, not what I'm doing right now, but what I would like to be doing long term. And so, being able to do this, do a commercial coral uh, farming operation, and taking consideration that if I'm having potentially 20, 30, 40, 50 uh, workers that are constantly publishing metrics back to the database itself, and be able to have a simple place that I could very quickly and easily query. Um, and this, and I'll be perfectly honest, this may come from a lack of knowledge on the actual performance uh, capabilities of Postgres, but I don't know if Postgres would be the right solution to be able to query potentially millions of rows, uh, especially since there's getting uh, multiple different, um, uh, s uh, multiple different uh, monitors feeding data to, to one central uh, database. And also, the barrier for entry, because I've done it before, was very, very low. I do understand that uh, I could have interacted with Postgres uh, programmatically uh, with, um, with uh, the Django ORM, but it was a very, very simple subset of telemetry data. So I, I, I figured for long-term uh, usability and uh, speed, of, uh, uh, speed of dashboards, if I ever did get to go to scale, uh, I, I, I fear that would be a better solution. Uh, and maybe another question, Jeremy. Imagine mm -hmm. that you are going to a commercial application for mm -hmm. you know, aquarium monitoring. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you then push, uh, I would say, some part of the app in the cloud, uh, whatever it would be, and just using the Raspberry Pi for uh, I would say controlling the sensors. Absolutely. And it could be a public cloud or a private on-prem solution. Um, inside the configuration, uh, it's defining where to send the uh, telemetry data to, wh what your influx URL is. Um, that could be something local or that could be something remote. It would just need to have IP reachability. Thanks. Perfect. Um, so a few people have been asking if there's going to be a recording available of this. Yes, we have, we are recording this. So it will be available later today on Influx Data's YouTube channel. It'll also be posted to our website. 
And Jeremy is going to send me the slides, so the slides will be available for review as well. Um, let's see, so we got another question here. The actions taken based on data, like turning lights on and off, is this done by the done by the Redis tasks or Grafana? It's not clear to me where the data in InfluxDB is being checked. So every time the, uh, the, the Redis worker collects the data, it evaluates the data, and then if and if an event needs, if a action needs to occur, it puts a job back into the, back into the queue for, uh, for it to be consumed. Um, so Grafana is not actually doing anything from the uh, task automation. Uh, it's self-contained within the, uh, the Django REST framework worker and the Redis queue. Um, Wim, I've allowed you, unmuted you in case you want to talk. If there's anything else you wanted to clarify on your question for Jeremy. Yeah, so the InfluxDB is merely for um, checking the data afterwards in Grafana. So it's not an active part in checking or uh, producing actions later on. Correct. The, the, the producing actions is handled uh, programmatically from Python as soon as it collects the data. Uh, but since I'm collecting it, I'm just uh, it's sent, it immediately sends it to Grafana to I'm uh, not Grafana to Influx to store. Okay, so there's no action based on like a running average, which would be obvious to do in InfluxDB, for instance. Threshold. So thresholds are defined within Grafana. Um, I do not have any actions or baseline thresholds that are defined within InfluxDB. But what you do now in Redis, you cannot do actions based on an average of the last 15 minutes, for instance. Only on the, action, on the measurements from now. That would be, that would be correct. But what's being done with Redis is done based off of an immediate, um, immediate item, not a blended 15-minute uh, average. I did that because I wanted to make sure <clears throat> If something is going wrong and I'm actually needing to take an action, um, waiting 15 minutes for if my temperature is skyrocketing, if my temperature is creeping up, waiting 15 minutes just means I'm 15 minutes, or I'm potentially up to 29 minutes uh, into a into a bad into a bad temperature swing. So yeah. for my for my specific use case, I, I wanted it to be a an immediate action and not necessarily a um, a blended a, a, a float a, a floating average blended action. But yes, that, that totally should be possible. Yeah, okay. Well, the reason was because that would be uh, showing the power of Influx mm -hmm. uh, database in aggregating and averaging and stuff like that. Okay, but that, yeah. answer my, that answers my question. Thank you. Perfect. Awesome. So we have another question from Victor. What size of data has been collected until now? What data is envisioned? How many records? So Victor, I think you should still be able to unmute yourself if you do want to expand upon your question. I think it's it's fairly clear if I think okay. it's the answer. So I have not looked at specifically how much is there. So let me see if I can quickly uh, get this data out. The amount of data right now is going to be very, very insignificant. Let me just see if I can quickly get it for you. Just to let everyone know, I think since we're over time, um, we're gonna, there's one more question that's come in. So we'll answer Victor's question and then the one last question 
Um, and if you have any more questions for Jeremy, feel free to email me. You should all have your e uh, have my email address, and I'm happy to forward them on to Jeremy. I'd go ahead and answer the next question while I am getting in, uh, trying to get this information out. Okay, so the next question is, are your thresholds set up manually or do you have a control loop to update these? They are set up manually at this time. Perfect. One second. Uh, yes. Personally, oh, go ahead, Victor. Do, personally, I I uh, lost track of the the type of sensors. It would be nice to to have it. Uh, if it's in the website, then the uh, the center the. the categories of data collected this from the sensors. So right now for what's deployed on uh, my current solution, it is just going to be uh, two sensors. And right now I have 235,359 um, uh, rows in the database itself. And that's coming from two sensors uh, since roughly July. Okay. Uh, right. the, the current measurements are done in uh, a 60 second uh, cron. Um, I, I could, I, if I was to look at different options for uh, scheduling, I could do a, a tighter interval. Um, but for me, uh, once every 60 seconds is perfectly fine. If I miss something that's up to a, a minute and 59 seconds, um, I should be perfectly fine if I, skip a, if I skip an individual one. But to a certain extent, I don't, collecting any, any quicker than once every 60 seconds, I don't know for a home application if that makes sense. Okay, thanks. Um, all right, I think we're going to wrap up here. Thank you so much, Jeremy, for presenting how you're using InfluxDB. I think there were lots of some, lots of questions. Um, so once again, the session has been recorded. The slides and the recording should be email, should be made available uh, end of day today. So you should be able to find those later on. Um, we have these virtual time series meetups every month. So if you have any if you're using um, time series data in a cool way and you want to share it with the community, please let me know. I'm always happy to work with our community members. I found Jeremy through a random LinkedIn post. So we're really good at finding our awesome um, community members and sharing their stories. Um, so thank you everyone for joining today's time series meetup. I will be reaching out to a couple of you. Um, we always like to give out swag so for some of you who are, you know, really awesome and were brave and, you know, we're okay with me unmuting you, <laughs> I'll reach out to you over email today or tomorrow and get your addresses so I can send some fun stickers your way. So thank you everyone. And I hope to see you next month at the next virtual time series meetup. And I also hope to see everyone at Influx Days. It'll be a very fun event. Thank you very much and have a good day. Thanks, all the best.